The Black Swan and Peter Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. Joseph Stalin was almost always in the audience when this ballet was performed at the Bolshoi Theater. He seemed to love the music and the dancing in Swan Lake above all else. When the curtain fell, he would return to the Kremlin and get back to work. On many nights, he had a literally murderous workload in front of him, often working until daybreak. Death warrants lay on his desk. Often he personally knew the condemned. They were his old comrades. His record for signing execution orders was 3,000 in a single night. When one reads Stalin's documents, and I've studied his entire personal archive, one is surprised. Human life meant nothing to him. It was just a dry statistic. He was an emotionless person who believed that revolution and progress could not be accomplished without terror and violence. For him, violence was a universal means and method for developing the state. The docks on the Moscow Volga Canal, a grand Stalinist project completed in 1937. A product of slave labor, just like many others in the Soviet state, built quickly and on the lives of millions of prisoners forced to work in the worst conditions. The victories of Stalinist socialism, colored plaques recall the great industrial works, the collectivization of agriculture, and the long canals which stretch for thousands of kilometers. Work on the Moscow Volga Canal has been ongoing since 1933 without consideration for the forced laborers, even in the freezing cold. This project was organized by the political police. The head of the camp speaks to his prisoners. Your attention for a moment, please. On behalf of the government and the party, and at the initiative of our dear leader, Comrade Stalin, we are now going to begin the construction of the biggest canal in the world which shall link Moscow with the Volga. You citizens are here as lawbreakers, but we regard you as people who will participate in fulfilling the biggest government project in the world. Hunger and hard labor in freezing temperatures kill untold thousands. Deported peasants, priests, intellectuals and criminals. This human material comes from all over the Soviet Union. The most progressive penal system in the world is planned in advance. The writer Maxim Gorky wrote, On the biggest building site in our country, we are transforming social misfits into honest workers. However, the reality is different from the beginning. The dispossessed prisoners are exploited by a power which has no regard for them, and yet record work quotas are still expected. A dam threatens to burst. Unrealistic plans lead to shoddy work. The number of work accidents is extremely high. Setbacks are inevitable. On the next day, these people will once again be herded back to work. Who does not pull his weight has his rations reduced. Yet the full ration is still a hunger ration. Prisoners have a choice, either to work to death or to starve to death. There is a grim saying around the camps, better half through hunger than all through work. A 
power apparatus of terror is built. The camp system brought Stalin a whole army of guards who are trained by the military. The political police becomes a powerful institution which stands alongside and eventually above the party. The political police have existed since the beginning of Bolshevik rule. A few weeks after the October Revolution, in December of 1917, the Bolsheviks established the Cheka, or the All-Russian Special Commission to Combat Counter-Revolution and Sabotage. The Cheka achieves infamy as a sentry of the revolution and terror of the bourgeoisie. The organization existed until the end of Soviet rule under a variety of names, GPU, OGPU, NKVD, MGB, and KGB. The Cheka use barbaric methods. Even in 1918, it executed thousands of people. The legendary head of the Cheka is Felix Dzerzhinsky, a Polish aristocrat and old Bolshevik, the organizer of the Red Terror. Iron Felix establishes a name for himself as incorruptible, but also as a tough and gray revolutionary policeman. Under his command, prisons and detention camps soon open. Zoya Fyodorovna remembers. Many young people used to meet at our place. We freely discussed everything. But it was a flat with multiple tenants, a communal apartment. There were many people around who spied for the police. My brother was sentenced to 10 years at the Solovki camp. I was allowed to visit him before he went to the camp, but he had to shout to me from behind the wire fence among a crowd of people. On one side were the prisoners, on the other their relatives, who had gathered to bid them farewell before they left for the camp. When I asked him why he had been arrested, he replied, because of my pure belief in Leninism. A prison ship lands on Solovki, an island on the White Sea in northern Russia. During Tsarist times, it was a place of exile for disgraced aristocrats. The island's monastery was closed in 1921. A year later, the political police opened a forced labor camp. This is where the enemies of the Soviet Union were brought to. White officers, rebellious red sailors, anarchists, socialists, social democrats, officials of the old regime, priests, engineers, black marketeers, speculators, and also criminals. Solovki is the mother of all prison camps in the Soviet Union, the first cell in the massive Gulag archipelago. The prisoner population is still relatively small. At most, 30,000 Soviet citizens sit in this camp, but even then, one could be sent to such a place at short notice. I had a well-trained memory because I was a stenographer. I came home and wrote out an entire conversation and put the paper inside a book. Then I forgot about it although I may have shown it to my mother. But the paper was discovered. These notes I had written about my brother. It dealt not only with his views, but also with the fact that he had already been tortured in 1929. Sometimes he was placed under a very strong lamp. Other times he was taken somewhere as if he were about to be shot. Because of these notes, I spent three years in a prison camp. The full extent of the miserable living and work conditions cannot be conveyed in these pictures. Every second prisoner perished during their ordeal. It was here in Solovki that the whole perfidious camp system with its punishment and reward system was created from a prisoner. 
Another prisoner attempted to escape by appealing to the party in the naive hope that the leadership would improve the conditions inside the camp. He wrote, To the Presidium of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the USSR, we are prisoners who were released from the Solovki prison camp because of illness. We arrived in good health and full of energy. We now leave as invalids, physically and morally crippled and broken. In the names of the thousands of people who are in prison there, we appeal to the leadership of the Soviet state to end the misery which reigns there. People are dropping like flies. Their deaths are painful. Most importantly, the entire burden of violence, despotism and injustice which rules over Solovki is borne on the shoulders of the workers and peasants. For now, counter-revolutionaries and conmen live there, live well there because they have money. And alongside them, because of the tyranny of the GPU guards, workers and peasants are dying because they don't have bribe money as they work 14 to 16 hours a day in the cold. And then there's the hunger. The guards make us stand barefoot in the night cold when there's frost and it's only 30 degrees. The investigative commission, which comes only once a year, has a slight idea of the atrocities there. Just one example of thousands. They forced us to eat our own excrement. It was under such conditions that the great buildings of communism were created in the 1930s. Another example is the canal between the Baltic Sea and the White Sea, which was built in just 19 months. The construction was overseen by Sergei Kirov, the party secretary for Leningrad. Of the 300,000 workers who toiled here, every third one died. The canal was named for Stalin. Few boats would follow the ships who made the first journeys through the canal. The Stalin Canal was a botched construction. Too flat, and in any case, half of the year it is under ice. Alexander Solzhenitsyn issued this judgment, to choose in haste is to be born blind. Iron ore in Magnitogorsk in the Urals, or in Magadan, north of the Arctic Circle, trains in the Soviet Far East, oil in coal in Siberia or in the desert steppes of Kazakhstan. Everywhere there was a mass army of slave laborers. The camps are constantly being filled, not just with political prisoners, some just have bad luck. I'm an old man. I know this time well. I lived through it myself. People really did have fear and were afraid to speak about anything which reflected badly on the leadership. They did not dare make critical remarks about the Central Committee, the Politburo and especially Stalin. Every careless word could end in tragedy. On our collective farm, the following once happened. A young man accidentally caused a bust of Stalin to fall and smash. Everyone was silent, deathly quiet. Two days later, this man disappeared. He was not seen again. He was accused of creating the accident on purpose to insult the leader. That was the kind of fear surrounding Stalin. But a society that is created out of fear cannot be stable. When the fear disappears, so does the society. And that is exactly what happened to our society, the one built by Stalin. Early 1937, the Moscow-Volga Canal is almost completed. This 128-kilometer-long waterway will link Moscow to the industrial centers on the Volga. The canal is also aimed at improving water supplies to the capital and regulating the river system around Moscow. Stalin appears in person to inspect the completion of this massive project. At Stalin's side is Nikolai Yezhov, the notorious chief of the NKVD political police. This period of the terror is named after him. In Russian, it is known as Yezhovchina. At the official opening in July 1937, 129 officials are awarded medals. The NKVD and the Construction Collective are paid gratitude. The numerous people who died during the project are not mentioned. Alone in the years between 1936 and 1938, the mass terror cost the lives of 1.3 million people. All the progress achieved in the Soviet Union was built on such barbarism.
Today there are only traces of most of the camps. Although the camps continued to exist well into the 1950s when they were shut down one camp at a time. Composer Olga Bergoltz wrote a song about one such camp. No, our poor books do not remind us of the beggar's bag. You'll know that we led bland and difficult lives. Life was raw and bitter. We did not dare be honest when we were interrogated, shaking and angry. We betrayed our own when forced to speak. Oh, the scandal of these deep wounds which we not only suffered there, the tragedy of the people who perished in the mines of Kolima. An August night in the year 1935, the miner Alexei Stakhanov extracts 14 times more coal in one shift than the normal quota requires. With this record accomplishment, the Stakhanov movement is born. The party promoted this event against the advice of coal industry experts. In front of the camera, Stakhanov's coal workers were beaming, but in reality, they hated him and his imitators. They knew their quotas would soon be raised and that even more work would be demanded of them. Stakhanov was bombarded with awards and honors. He was allowed to meet with Stalin in the Kremlin. Previously, there were 23 of us miners. Now there are just 10. Naturally, you think this is more difficult, but there are no problems. Quite the opposite. It's actually a relief, a big relief. What do we receive for this work? Before, my wage was 450 rubles, but now we and other miners earn up to 2,000 rubles. The hero of labor receives his own automobile. This is aimed at inspiring other workers. Everywhere, normal production quotas are raised. Stalin holds a speech against stagnation. Production records are reportedly broken all over the Soviet Union. Alexei Stakhanov is no longer an ordinary worker. He travels the country as a propagandist and becomes a delegate to the Supreme Soviet. An audience with the great leader Stalin. The best female workers from a rhubarb collective. The best worker movement is the high point of Stalin's industrialization program, but economically it is a flop. Work record holders often disrupted the pace of production. The triumphant return of the rhubarb workers who visited Stalin, at least according to this propaganda film, in reality they were hated by their fellow workers for disrupting pay scales. A gift from the party. For many years, the gift was a gramophone with recordings of Stalin's speeches, a gift which hardly motivated the workers. 